how do they come in? And my answer is usually through a moment or a place of weakness. The devil searches for the weak moment or the weak place to come in. That's exactly how you were describing the man that had the viper that came there, wasn't it? Yeah. That's vivid. I can't go into it anyhow. Now, what are the moments or places of weakness? This is not an exhaustive list, but it'll give you some understanding. First of all, prenatal. Many infants are born with a demon in them. And it happens because of something that the mother did or didn't do. And the greatest single problem that exposes children to demons, unborn children, is involvement in the occult. And I want to say, you cannot get involved in the occult in any form without being exposed to demons. There was a proverb that used to say, he, he who sups with the devil needs a spoon with a long handle. I want to tell you, there is no spoon made with a handle long enough to make it safe to sup, sup with the devil. And I want to read from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 in the NIV because the language is more up to date. This is what God says about the occult. That is involvement with any kind of spirits that aren't spirits from God. Uh, it's, it's written to, uh, to Israel before they entered the land. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9. When you enter the land your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. So the first kind of person is those who actually make their own children living sacrifices, presenting them in a furnace to the God Merlin. And I want you to understand, it's very important, all the other practices that follow are in the same category with offering your infant as a sacrifice to Merlin. God doesn't put any distinction. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery. You know what divination is? Fortune telling. It's trying to discern something supernaturally by a spirit that is not from God. Every fortune teller is a diviner. If you've ever been to a fortune teller, you've been exposed to a spirit of divination. I remember dealing with a woman who needed spirit, deliverance from the spirit of divination. She said, I can't understand how it ever came into me. But I discovered that in the newspaper, she regularly read the horoscope pages. That's all you need to do. None of you I know ever did that. Who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, which is rampant in the United States today, from the top of the nation downward, from the White House downward, witchcraft is rampant. Or who casts spells, or is a medium, or a spiritist, or consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Anyone who does any of those things is detestable. If you go to a fortune teller, that's detestable. God puts it in the same category with people who offer their infants in sacrifices to, a, to, a, to an evil God. You might say, well, what's wrong with the occult? I'll try to explain it this way. When you get involved in the occult, you're making friends with God's enemy. And God takes note of that. And you have to repent and you have to cancel any involvement if you want help from God. So that's, let me give you an example, a remarkable example that happened fairly recently. A woman, a very fine Christian woman, came to me with real grief. She said, we just had a letter from my son who's at college telling us that he's been homosexual from the womb. That he was born a homosexual. So I began to talk to her and I said, uh, when you were pregnant with your son, did you do anything that's occult? Well, she said, yes, I tried to divine 
whether it was male or female, boy or girl, I had a pendulum suspended in front of my womb, and I knew if it went one way, it was a boy, and went another way, it was a girl. I said to her, you exposed your unborn son to a demon by what you did. That's why he's homosexual from birth. Now, she's a very solid Christian woman. She understood, she repented, and I believe in due course her prayers will bring deliverance to her son. But let that be a warning to you. You cannot fool around with the occult in any form or shape. And if you want a further definition of the occult, it's in my book. I have another very common demon that enters unborn children is the demon of rejection. Um, see, every little baby comes into the world craving one thing more than anything else, which is what? Love, that's right. But you see, the mother has got too many children, she hasn't got enough income, she discovers she's pregnant, and she regrets it. She doesn't have to say anything. She just says, I wish I didn't, wasn't going to have this baby. That baby is born with a spirit of rejection. Now this is true of my second wife, Ruth. She was born in the height of the Depression in 1930. She was the eighth child, and her mother was already struggling to feed the seven previous children. And without saying anything, the mother resented having another mouth to feed. And Ruth had to be delivered from a spirit of rejection. Thank God we knew what to do, and she was wonderfully delivered. But rejection is one of the commonest demons, and it enters very frequently while a person is still in his mother's womb. <clears throat> then there are pressures in early childhood. James chapter 3 and verse 16 says this. James 3, 16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So in a strife-torn, disharmonious home, the children, born or unborn, are automatically exposed to demons. And most children do not have strong enough defenses to keep the demons up. So any child born in an unhappy, strife-torn, divided home is exposed to demons. How many such homes are there in the United States today? There are many, aren't there? See, parents are responsible to maintain an atmosphere in their homes in which the children can grow up free from demonic molestation. But very few parents in contemporary America are doing it. That's one reason why I wrote my book, Husbands and Fathers, because the number one failure in American culture is the husband and the father. And everything ultimately revolves around him. It's wonderful what wives and mothers can do, but no wife and mother is a substitute for the father. And the greatest single need of America today is men who are real fathers. Amen? Come on, you ladies, you say amen.